he has in his music, in his work, affected just about all of us and has um, worked in a musical scope that has really essentially affected American rock and roll for the last decade. And his name is Robert Hunter, and I guess everyone probably knows you best from the fact that you are quite often, in fact, most of the time, the lyricist for the Grateful Dead. And um, welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here in Roslyn. I got, <laughs> it is, I got up at 8.30 this morning and jogged across the bridge over to my father's place to look at it in daylight. And uh, spent a couple of hours just walking up one side of the town and down the other. It's a beautiful place. I dig to come back here and spend a couple of weeks sometime. I'm sure a lot of people would <laughs> prefer you to be in the area more often than you are. Um, you know what I'd like to do, and Robert and I were talking about this a bit before we started actually recording, I'd like to sort of chronologically trace your work, and um, I, we're going to have to speed through it simply because to do it properly and from the uh, best historical viewpoint would take hours upon hours because you have literally written thousands of songs, it seems like, and I'm sure there's many that uh, we haven't yet had a chance to hear. Um, to begin with, I guess, how did it start for you? Where did... Um... I started uh, when I lived at, uh, in Stamford, Connecticut. It was... Uh, I played... Uh, had a band in the 12th grade called The Crescents and went to Stamford High School for a year. And uh, we would play around uh, little dances and things. I played trumpet. I had a bass clarinet and a... Uh, uh, guitar and drums. We played veterans, uh, hospitals, and uh, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, what have you. And uh, I wrote a tune called Rock and Roll Moon, which I sent off to uh, one of those little ads, uh, Tin Pan Alley ads. It says, uh, uh, "We will set, uh, well, uh, send us your tunes, you know, and we'll we'll publish them for you or something like that." And I got a thing back that says that the words were good, but the music was lacking. That they would rewrite the music for me for a fee and uh, and, uh, uh, and give me promotion and everything. And I was smart enough to know it was a scam right then. But uh, that's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> how did you cross paths with the Grateful Dead? And obviously it had to be early in the history of the Dead. Well, I came back to California and I looked up an old girlfriend. So I had gone to two years of uh, high school in uh, California. I had been in school in California, 8th grade through uh, through 11th, I guess it was. And then uh, I looked up an old girlfriend, and she was going with Garcia. So I met Garcia, and uh, I had just gotten out of the Army, and I bought myself, I think it was a uh, 1940 Chrysler Straight 8, really fine car. And uh, so I had a car and nobody else had one. I ran into Garcia and Trist at uh, St. Michael's Alley about a, a night later. And they found out I had a car, so they came banging on my door the next day wanting me to take them to Berkeley. And the three of us were pretty inseparable after that for a long time. And it was, I had been doing a folk singing uh, at service clubs while I was in the Army. It's a six month hitch, it was all. And, uh, So I just fell into it naturally. I was at a party with Garcia, and uh, there was one guitar there. So, you know, me being the folk singer, I didn't know he played it. I snatched it up and began singing my folk songs as I would do at parties. And uh, he uh, said, give me that guitar, right? So, you know, I was gracious, and I let him have it. He never gave the damn thing back the rest of the evening. So I got another guitar, and uh, we got into uh, duet playing. And uh, we played at the local coffee houses and bookstore and Kepler's bookstore, which was the uh, kind of the uh, place where uh, the, what do you call it, the peace scene started happening. Roy Kepler and Ira Sandpearl uh, had that number going over there. So we were the house band and we played at Stanford and whatnot. And uh, then we uh, took on Dave Nelson and uh, started a bluegrass band and uh, went through several bluegrass bands and uh, then uh, Mother McCree's Jug Band came up and uh, I was out of town for a while when that formed 
And uh, I came back and Jerry asked me if I wanted to play Jug. And uh, I gave a couple of poots into the Jug and couldn't get a sound out of it and said, I don't think I can. And it was, so I didn't... Uh, I dropped out of, of the music at that point and went into another scene. And uh, the dead formed from that. And uh, I went up to New Mexico for a while and uh, wrote some lyrics. I think it was uh, China Cat and Alligator and some stuff like that and mailed them back to Garcia. And the band put them together. And uh, so then I came back out and uh, hooked up and uh, just stayed with it. Mm-hmm. What I'd like to do is to take the albums, perhaps, and we'll just sort of use them as a chronological kind of guide to your musical stuff and talk about some songs from each of the albums, perhaps, and get into playing as much as we can, because as I mentioned, we could go on for quite a while. We have a lot of material to work with, so why don't we do that? What's it like to be on, have your songs on so many records i mean i have a stack they can't see but we have a, a, a real stack. this is this is it huh? I'm well I'm, I'm even lacking a few here you have red octopus no, and, and dragonfly no i don't have any of the Baron von Tobit. yeah i've been writing for them for a couple of years too four albums right up to uh like uh spitfire was the first one in years i didn't have anything on but we will uh nice up about five ten pounds <laughs> Never seen them all together. All right, we'll work on them. Now, the first album that you are credited for actually writing on is Oxamoxa. You know, for some reason, they didn't give me credit on Alligator uh, for uh, Anthem of the Sun. I was quite disappointed. Is Dark Star on it, too? No, no, it only has Alligator. That's all I wrote on that. So Alligator really was the first recorded Hunter composition? What was it like when you heard that? Do you remember what your reaction was to hearing your words put to the music of the dead? Well, by the time it was out on the record and like that, I'd heard it a considerable number of times. It was quite exciting, actually, though, when I came from uh, New Mexico to hear them uh, playing Alligator. Uh, it was because uh, I'd been sitting around playing it for friends, and, and, and it, was, it was, well, you know, they weren't like the Grateful Dead at that point it was it was it was no it was exciting but it was uh it wasn't exciting enough to blow your mind exactly it was small time at that point i think we sold about twenty five thousand copies of oxo moxo and probably less of that than anthem mm-hmm. but still it was the business and uh you know i went out there uh we were doing a gig in rio nido and uh that afternoon before before the performance first time i heard him playing my stuff they were working on Dark Star. So I was just in, in the motel room hearing the music from uh, uh, across the way. And uh, I start scratched the lyrics out for that, about half of it then. And went in and presented them with that, and that worked right away. So you know, we all knew each other well enough, but it was really easy to function. They assumed that I was the writer right away, and I assumed that I was too. And uh, just picked up from there. All right. To move on to... Uh well, Oxa Moxa really um, presented a song that has been um, a big favorite, and of course, uh, probably because it was on the Live Dead album, and got an awful lot of airplay and reaction on that, and that was St. Stephen. Um, what do you recall about that particular song? Um, well, I had a silly little melody for it. And, uh, let's see, I think I wrote that about one time, it's not easy to recall, I think I wrote it in, in, in three or four settings, sittings, I liked, uh, I got into a lyric flow with it, uh, a sense of some sort of importance about it, uh, I had some nice experiences of, of being, writing just the right thing, you know, of, of that sort of unbelief of it, seeing, the words just coming out so nice and uh but it was that was the dead then again you know like uh realizing at that point that i was writing it for them gave me a, a kind of an energy that i uh i used at that point it was exciting and i realized that i was gonna write an album i'd been invited to robert hunter is our guest robert a performer in his own right 
and a lyricist for, for many, many songs that you know from the Grateful Dead. And as you pointed out, the Jefferson Starship. And um, you were going, tracing essentially back in the early stages of the Grateful Dead. Live Dead, certainly um, a very important album in their evolution. Um, what were those tunes like doing? Well, I told you about Dark Star and St. Stephen. The Eleven was originally part of uh, China Cat. And, uh, but uh, they got, that got clipped and put into a different segment. I think they used to do China Cat and the Eleven together a lot, actually. And the others. That's all I really have to say about that one. I think that the lyrics were published on this one, which was uh, the first time that I did that, and last time I did that until Blues for All. Although I'm telling you, I wrote, uh, I guess, all but one of the lyrics on uh, Garcia's new album, and I'm going to publish lyrics again because uh, I'm beginning to find out after all these years that they aren't really heard mm -hmm. too well, and uh, uh, I don't like that, so I'm going to do it. Have you ever considered publishing the lyrics mm -hmm. in any kind of book form? Is that a possibility? I've got a stack of them here that I'm... Of, um, just about all of them that I'm uh, working on editing right now because there were a lot of errors in it. Uh, I, to make sure that they didn't publish the lyrics, which I didn't want for a while, uh, I felt that if uh, someone could read the lyrics and listen to the music, they only had to go through the album once and I wanted them to dig more than that. I know that I had a tendency to do that when, I, when the words were written down and I wanted them to, to take the whole thing as a unit. So, I don't really have fair copies of many of the lyrics at all. Uh, I would make the secretaries uh, take the tapes and transcribe them from the tapes, and uh, there are errors in all the transcriptions. There are errors in the lyrics in the songbooks, even, because of that. But I felt that if I wrote them all out, that they were going to get published, so I just wanted to have kinds of copies around. And now I'm working through it and uh, needing it up towards publishing them. <laughs> Great. Working Man's Dead next. That's my baby. I like that record. That was essentially the commercial breakthrough, wasn't it, Working Man's Dead, as far as the band went? We were in New York, and uh, uh, I remember getting into a, uh, an elevator. Like, we had gotten around 190 on the charts, uh, some of that before. We were getting in an elevator, and somebody, I think it was Rock, came up and said, we're number 17 in Billboard with a bullet block. You know, and that was the beginning, you know, like all of a sudden, I mean, that elevator was going up. <laughs> right? We might have been going down in it, but yeah, it was it was a, an amazing flash, you know, just one of those fill your head with light trips. You say, my God, we're really making it. You know, it's not a fantasy anymore. <laughs> to talk about Working Man's Dead, one of the prettiest songs that you have ever written is Uncle John's Band. Yeah, that's a honey. That's also one of the few tunes on this record that I worked very, very hard at. Uh, Jerry uh, made a tape of the tune, and uh, I sat with that tape. We were living in the same house at the time, call it, which is one reason that the collaboration uh, through this and American Beauty is so good, because we were just right there all the time for a couple of years. But, uh, I don't know, Uncle John's band, yeah. I had that feeling that, uh, that, that this was a tune. No, this is, this is worth really working, really getting correct. Let's see what else is it? High Time and Dire Wolf. Dire Wolf I wrote, uh, waking up one morning after having had the dream that this story is, uh, describing. And kind of, uh, before I fully woke up, I sat down and just uh, you know, grabbed the guitar and put the thing right down. And Speedway Boogie I wrote right after Alison Laws, I think the next day, because the press was coming in, and it was just, just terrible. And uh, so this was like a press release for immediate release, you know, about the only thing we could say about it, you know, one way or another, where we could just keep on coming or stand and wait. You know, there was no alternative but to keep to keep doing what we were doing, even though at that point it, it boiled into a tragedy, I suppose, in some people's eyes. Well, it was, certainly. Cumberland Blues, I, I don't remember writing that. That's, I draw a blank on when that might have been done. And the song that um, 
you get a phone call for every show you do at WLIR. It's Casey Jones. I mean, it is just one of the most popular tunes around. At one point, I just, uh, in my notebooks on one page, I had just written, I don't know what prompted it, uh, it just, I heard, I, I heard the line in my head, and it just tickled me. Driving that train high on cocaine, Casey Jones, you better watch your speed. And that was the only thing written on that page, and it was uh, probably about uh, three or four months later when I opened the book up and just continued it. I mean, it was easy, easy to continue. It was an easy song to write. Talked right out. It's classic in a way, you know, the story of Casey Jones. I just put the additional twist of uh, one reason that he may have been driving too fast, trying to make things on time. Okay. <laughs> well, there's Working Man's Dead done. All right. At the high time, which I don't remember much about writing over. Robert Hunter is our guest. We're WLIRFM at 92.7 in stereo. I'm Dennis McNamara. And we're going through the works of Robert Hunter, which is quite a lot of music, quite a lot of great music. Working Man's Dead, where we just finished off, and American Beauty. We're... We were very close, I thought. You, you mentioned that earlier, but um, certainly there was a feel that came out pretty quick well, together. A, there is a, a third album in that ser- what I consider a series of Working Man's Dead, American Beauty, and then this uh, Grateful Dead album, the live one. Europe. It's, yeah, yeah, Europe 72. Let me open this thing up and see what the... The shrink wrap pulled away. And I've asked Warner Brothers acts because they're they're into putting out best of the Grateful Dead albums and things, and they're doing a pretty nice job on that. But this um, this I would like put out as one record, at, which is a companion. I, I feel to those others. This is a surprise to me when this came out into a three album set because the there was there was an album of songs which was a companion to those which which had uh, He's Gone, Jack Straw, uh, Brown Eyed Women, Ramble on Rose. Uh, Sugar Magnolia, no wait, not Sugar Magnolia, it's from Ox Max, uh, Mr. Charlie, Tennessee Jed, and this is a fine, fat album of songs, right, which which is, uh, people don't maybe dig, like, through listening to all three three albums that are here in this set, so I would like one of those to release that one uh, as a companion to those other, because I think... I feel that in those three albums, I hit kind of the peak of my songwriting. Mm-hmm. But I hope I'll get another peak. But, uh, boy, I look back at some of the stuff I wrote, and I go, whoopee, boy. I guess I just have to have my head back in that space, you know. To You do this thing for a decade and more, and uh, some of the thrill definitely is, is gone, seeing, oh, ho-hum, here's another record that I have credits on like that. But, boy, that, that first credit, you know, the not getting it on Anthem, that still smarts. You know, I can, I can, I remember how it felt not to have it on there. But now it's getting less. I, I think that this, I'm hoping that this going out with my band, and especially like starting to do my own solo show, is gonna is going to give me the feeling again. I haven't been out on the road for years now, and uh, today just getting up doing what I used to do on the road, you know, getting out and trucking, you know, you know jogging across the bridge, you know, look at, looking in windows, you know, uh, forgot to shave, look, looking scruffy, and all of a sudden I thought, wait, this is Nassau County, you can get busted for looking scruffy here, can't you? No, times have changed. They yeah? have? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, anyway, I was walking along feeling just the way I always felt, you know, like kind of like a, a nice, healthy, happy underdog, mm-hmm. and, and I... I some of that feeling was back, you know, like up in Buffalo, I remember, you know, up in the winter, uh, just getting out there. This thing I do, I get up first thing every morning, because I was seeing the country, the band uh, snoozing away all day, and I was always a crackerjack for getting up and seeing the towns. All right. Today, I, hope, I hope something comes of it. Great, that's good to hear. American Beauty is the album that we are at now, and... Again, boy, we could just pull off just about any song, and you will find a, you'll find a favorite. Yeah. Um, I've been sitting here uh, before you came in, running running over Box of Rain. I'd like to perform that. Uh, that'd be a very good solo song, just a guitar and a voice. I do that quite well. Friend of the Devil. Uh, um, I do do with uh, comfort. I do uh, Friend of the Devil, and... Uh, once in a blue moon, I do ripple with them. Mm-hmm. But as I said, I'm, I'm very, very tentative about doing Grateful Dead songs with comfort. And when we do them, we do them 
try and do it kind of different, as different as you can get them, having them right. be the same song. I do a real up tempo for Under the Devil. I was going to ask you, Sugar Magnolia, that's one that um, is quite popular. What was that like? What do you think back to when you think about that? That's a song that went through a lot of, of uh, transitions before. Some things started with some kind of... Uh, <laughs> I had a melody for it. Mm -hmm. I know the blossom is there. I haven't got a thought about it, that's all I care. Chug a look and murder, man, I cure my line. Well, I wrote a note to tell you everybody is fine. The sugar magnolia, you can't bear to beware. You can't go casting notions with a hook in the air. And I passed that on to Weir, and it turned into uh, the monster that it is. He just worked to death on it, and uh, Weir is a hard taskmaster. He wants everything to be just the way he wants it, so we, uh, we went... Uh, uh, around and around and around about it, and he'd go off and work on it some more, and then he'd bring it back and demand more lyrics or better lyrics, and then uh, when it was all done, he wanted some extravaganza to cap it all off, so, so I wrote that uh, Sunshine Daydream thing for, like, right in the studio. I just went out and and put it down, handed it to him, he said, that's just fine, and then just then tacked it on. Yeah. And so that happened. I, I, I do think that's a monster. The first time that song ever came off, uh, in concert was in Chicago. They had been playing it uh, a lot, but um, the audience had only reacted very mildly to it. So uh, Bob Matthews was at the uh, uh, soundboard at that time, and he went off into the audience uh, or, or backstage or something like that, and, I, and there was nobody there at the sound booth. So I zipped in there, and, uh, and we started singing, and I just cranked his vocal up, which is like, because there, there was a kind of a thing where everything should be at the same level, including the voices, which tended to get lost. And I just cranked it up, and the audience just sat up to the thing, and then they then then they had the reaction to it at the end that they've had ever since, like that. So from that point up, that vocal got turned up, and, it and then they, <laughs> I just came running back, <laughs> smack my hands. <laughs> Trucking is a song that um, I guess you know if you walked up to the average. Grateful Dead fan and said, name three songs. Trucking would be in there, probably. Um, it's really the story of what it was like, I guess, right? I wrote that verse to verse pretty much on the road. And, uh, like, I wrote the verses, that, and a few lines about Texas I wrote down in, in, in Dallas. And uh, I wrote uh, the verses about Buffalo up in Buffalo. You know, it was, uh, and it was intended to be a, a continuing chronology. Pack of Boys asked me, uh, a couple of months ago, if I would update it, I said, "Oh no, I let Sleeping Dogs lie." But they insisted, and so I did. And uh, I don't know if they're going to do a new verses or not. Hard to say, but I wrote about half a dozen more, and they were uh, very easy to write. It's it's it's, it's a groove that I can fall into so easily. It reminds me that I wrote that song when I sit down and uh, uh, and write more to it because I can get right into the same flow on it. Robert Hunter is our guest. Robert is, I don't know, I, I, I find it so hard to go around and explain it. You are, whether it says it or not on the albums, you are very definitely an important <laughs> member of the Grateful Dead and have been for a long time. Well, yeah, they used to list me as, as part of it, see? Mm -hmm. the, on the band, Robert Hunter, somewhere. It's like that. Uh, they stopped doing that when uh, they started uh, using, uh, on this album, like, uh, I don't I think uh, the Grateful Dead album here that I'm listed as songwriter anymore. Because they did things like me and my uncle, Big Boss Man, me and Bobby McGee and Johnny Be Good, I didn't write any of that stuff, so I kind of got... And I didn't really insist too much. I, I tended to uh, not follow my own interests very much. And, and they stopped listing me as songwriter, and I, uh, in the public's eye, when it isn't written, when it isn't in print, then it isn't that way anymore. And you know, audiences are fickle. They have a memory span of about two years. And so if you don't keep pumping yourself, you can disappear in this business very, very quickly, which I woke up uh, a year or two ago and realized it happened to me, that I had just dropped into the obscurity that could have been uh, predicted from not doing any promo or interviews and whatnot. I, I'm beginning to realize that it's not good policy to make uh, enemies of the press and the way that you make enemies with the press is not doing interviews.
from uh, the uh, appearances that you're too good for that. And maybe I did have such some such tomfool notion at the time that uh, that I didn't have to uh, uh, get my own uh, feet wet. Mm -hmm. when I, I had a nice trip there writing for the dead, keeping my privacy, being unrecognized, and uh, still having it all coming in. It was a very, very nice space. And now I'm paying for it. I, mean, I think I'm paying some belated dues. We're working real hard at this band. And when we aren't working, we're not rehearsing the band or on the roof, and I'm working on my solo show. It keeps me busy, and I'm really enjoying it. I love performing. I get a lot of energy, and, uh, and I'm pretty much jumping Jack Flash on the stage. Uh, I warm up quick, and I love it. Is that you, I think? Maybe you give me some reflections on them, and sure. you throw songs back at me and reflect, if that makes sense. Uh, a song that's been recorded in a number of varieties, and all of them pleasing, is playing in the band. Real, real good tune. Can you tell me about that? And which version I should play after we talk about it? Oh, Lord, I don't remember the various versions of it. I did, See, I don't have a needle on my stereo set, and... Uh, I haven't played any of these records in years, just years and years and years. I, I don't really have to, too, because I remember them in my head and just put the needle on and hear most of them. Great version of it on the Bob Weir Ace album. I think Mickey had a rhythm for it, and uh, <clears throat> I wrote the uh, the words to uh, Mickey's rhythm. And then Weir uh, wrote, uh, he came in, dug it, and uh, Mickey asked him to uh, put the chords to it. Yeah, which he did, and that's about all there was to that song on Mickey's album, Here Which Falls. It says music by Weir and Mickey, and words by me. Is another interesting one. Mickey took his uh, uh, tape recorder out to uh, his pump room, and the uh, the pump goes. Uh, <laughs> and Mickey's crazy. Up he does is he comes to me, he hands me this tape of, of his pump, and says write words to it. So I was looking at what. So I actually went down to the pump room finally, you know, and just took my pad and paper and wrote it to the pump. You know, Moses came riding up on a guitar, and then dun, 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 and well, we came around again like that, and, and he and he set the da 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 and put some chords to it, and then we had another song provided for us by nature in a way. That's the story of that. It's called the greatest story ever told. Now on where's album. What about Bertha? Is it true she was a fan? Uh, an electrical fan? No, this was this was after the fact. I don't know where that started. They, I think they called. They started calling this fan in the office that would run around and try and catch everyone and cut their fingers off. They started calling it Bertha, but no, this is not. This is not true. And Bertha, Bertha, I think is probably some vague uh, connotation of birth, death, and reincarnation. And, uh, cycle of existence is that some kind of such nonsense uh, like that i wouldn't be surprised but then again it might not be i don't remember <laughs> birth is another one that is very very popular one of the most popular grateful dead tunes oh yeah it's such a good it's going to usually be a good night when they start off playing birth what about working with barry garcia as a solo performer for his solo albums does that affect you in your writing or anything um, when you write a song I guess I should ask, do you know if it's going to be for a Grateful Dead album or for a Garcia or Bob Weir solo album? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> the best the best that can happen is that I'm just being prolific at the time and, uh, and just have lots of songs and then uh, pass them around. But uh, that happens uh, most of the time as I initiate them and uh, I give, give Jerry lyrics uh, and uh, he'll work on them. And then uh, less often... Uh, uh, he, he'll give me uh, tapes and tunes, he'll play them for me, and I'll tape them, and uh, I'll write them on the spot. Let's go to uh, the first Garcia solo album. <laughs> we have albums all over the floor here. This is uh, the next one, that were it not a Garcia solo album, would be would fit in right without Working Man's Dead, American Beauty, and uh, Europe's 72 feel of songs. This would be even four together, but this is not fair to add that to it since this is so um But this has got a, a lot of the things that have that same sort of feeling that the American Beauty songs have the uh, the uh, sugary and loser, especially in Deal. Now that bird song it, we wrote for Janis Joplin, which is not commonly known. Sugary, what was that one like? Uh, I remember when I was. 
was uh, being a criminal back many years ago. A friend of mine uh, always used to say, when he'd leave, he'd say, Okay, hold your mud and don't mention my name. And uh, that was the genesis of uh, Just Don't Tell Him You Know Me. It was a uh, kind of criminal consciousness of the, the ethic that when you when you get busted, when they come to take you down, hold your mud and don't mention my name. That's the essence of it. And the deal? Can you talk about that a little? See, that's what goes up. It costs a lot to me. Uh, I think that's probably that's reflections on what it's like being in the uh, in the rock and roll business or the music business. It uh, costs a lot to win, but it costs even more to lose. And all I'm asking you for is one gold dollar. I can pay you back with one good hand. That's the situation I'm in with comfort right now. All I'm asking for is is support because I got this number going, and if I can if I can get support on it, which I think I can, I hope I can, then I can do it. You know, and I can give people more music. And if it isn't supported, then it's got to go down the tubes, and I get back to my uh, typewriter, I suppose. We'll see. This is an important time for us coming out to New York. Mm-hmm. And it's a large band, eight pieces. It's not that easy to. Uh, uh, we won't make any money on the trip. We'll lose some on it, and uh, but we want to get heard out here, and I want a chance to play for these people. I've been told that I'll have a, a really good reception here without fail, and uh, I'm just looking forward to it. Now, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I would say whoever told you that is absolutely correct. Because this is the right market. <laughs> Getting into marketing business type terms is the deal with with have you, I guess. The wheel also not, expresses that sort of sentiment. The wheel is turning and you can't slow down and you can't get... The wheel is turning and you can't hold on, you can't let go and you can't slow down or something like that. That's also the nature of this business. You know, you are on, on that. You're riding the back of the tiger. And you get off in obscurity. The weight's right there for you. This, uh, and uh, once you get a taste for this, you don't want to get obscure, i got to say. Because you know, I've been talking to people for a long time. And, uh, boy, you know, I really want to keep doing that. I'd love to do it. It's, you know, if I can find something to say, or, or stay alive, basically, stay aware and alive, I think I have something to say. All right, Robert Hunter is our guest. We're WLIRFM at 92.7 in stereo. Picture a hotel room, I guess in Rosman is where we are, and a whole lot of albums all over the floor because we're sort of jumping around. And Robert has written songs for the Grateful Dead for most of their career from the beginning. Most of the songs that people know he's written for the Starship. We haven't talked about the Starship at all. Um, what was that? Was that anything different essentially than working with the Grateful Dead? In the Starship, I worked with Freiburg and uh, he was an old friend from Quicksilver days when he played bass for Quicksilver and uh, he just came around. He, he had been wanting to write with me for years but he'd never really had a vehicle to do it with and uh, he fell in with uh, Paul and Grace after the airplane broke up and he came around I think it was uh, Baron Von Tolbooth was the one that we wrote uh, Harp Tree on which uh, is another one I wish I could find the changes for it I don't, as I said I don't have a uh, needle for my record player, I don't have a copy of the words and I don't have a lead sheet anywhere I'd love to learn the song but I just can't remember too much how it goes except the lyrics and then after that uh, he came over with uh, no, uh, was it? Oh, Grace Slick's solo album. A very strange thing happened on that. For some reason, is that the Manhole album? Yeah. She was gracious enough. Totally surprised me when the album came out. I thought I was writing it for her. And on her solo album, there's a song by uh, me and Thyberg, uh, sung by David. I don't even think she plays anything on it. And I, I can't explain it. It's called It's Only Music. <laughs> it's a nice tune. Then I wrote uh, Come to Life with Firebird for uh, the Dragonfly album, and then I wrote uh, uh, Tumbling on Red Octopus with Firebird. Which Marty Ballin sang, didn't he? And then Marty uh, wrote the uh, the lyrics, go, this time I'll ever go, this time, but Marty wrote that, but he put, he put the schmaltz in it, like that, and and I really respect that guy, he's, um, for, uh, for his love of schmaltz, you know, because he, he does, and he'd be the last, last to deny it. He likes that crooner edge on it, because he is one of the one of the all-time great crooners, I think. One of the last of the crooners, too. 
I guess I blew it. Uh, I wrote on one for uh, what turned out to be the Spitfire album. I wrote a tune called Nighthawk, and uh, it was going to be the title piece for the album, and they had the cover drawn and whatnot. And uh, I was just waiting for it to come out, and I ran down to my record store. There it was, and the song was not it, much less was it not, not the title tune. But the th and uh, I realized that, um, well, I just didn't put the attention to them that I do with the dead. I didn't you know, hang out or, or like try and be part of the band very much. And uh, uh, it's, you know, the guys who were writing the band, I think it was replaced by something that uh, the drummer wrote. And uh, the people in the band have, uh, who are working and functioning in the band should have the publishing you know, and the tunes on it. And uh, so I, I never felt in the least bitter about not doing that. And subsequently I haven't worked with them. But not that I wouldn't in a flash they asked me, but they're off on, a, on another trip now. But I was with them while, while they were in that between the, between the airplane and, and Starship thing. It was, a, it was a nice time, and I enjoyed being part of them. While they were underdogs, it was fun. They're not underdogs anymore, but they were for a while. And it is fun working with underdogs. Okay, Robert Hunt. I also would like to say that I think Grace Slick is one of the best lyricists around. No, I don't think that she gets cited for that very often. Boy, she writes a mean, rangy lyric. You know, she does. As a lyricist, who who else do you respect? I mean, what lyrics in contemporary music around today do you, you look at and say, "Wow, that's well done"? Uh, Robert Burns and Walter Scott. <laughs> Contemporary, I'm just not, see, I, I, I'm very, very, uh, uh, what's the word, bemused, uh, somewhat amazed. Uh, Patty Smith's lyrics are uh, quite a trip. They're very, very heartfelt. She's, uh, and very unusual. She has a tendency to, uh, grand notions, which I think is, is, is fine. Like, she really, you know, she's... There's no little things sitting there. There's this big, full of jewels and blood and uh, and things. Maybe even to a fault in certain respects. I think she may may temper that. After all, it, it can lose its effect with, with too much of the heaviness. But too many people don't have any at all. And she has an amazing amount. Very, very good. And I and I, and I hope she keeps recording. Uh, and uh, Springsteen, I thought was quite good. Like that, he's got a, a way with a tough lyric. I think those lyrics for Born to Run are uh, just phenomenal. But was like, day we sweated out on the street of a run American, a runaway American dream. At night we ride to visions of glory in our suicide machines. <laughs> and chill out my back. This is quite good. Robert Hunter is our guest. And Robert is a um, lyricist for the Grateful Dead. He's worked with the Starship and has released a couple albums of his own. We've talked about um, the dead up to a certain point, and then we sort of um, were led astray talking about other things. And solo projects, of course, were in there. At that point, Bob Weir had a solo album. Jerry has at least three or four solo albums. At this point, there's a new one coming as we speak. And Nicky Hart had one. His hottest product right now. Really? Yeah. yeah. The, the Bob Weir album or the Garcia? The Weir. The Weir. Oh, yeah, the Weir album's out, man. It is hot. Bombs away. Yeah, for, uh, yeah. That will be out on PDQ. Uh, it's done and uh, ready to be out. That has the best writing I've done in a Coons A Giant, I've got to say. I've got uh, some excellent material on that. It was really a blast making. We got our own studio at last, and... Uh, we just hung out there for months and months and months doing that. And, uh, well, let's, um, this is a little weird, but as we speak, the Nick Cherry Garcia album isn't out, but maybe let's talk about some of the songs, and hopefully by part two of this show, the album will be out. We'll take that chance. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's the title song. is uh, Cats Under the Stars, which is a tune that I have been working on for years. And... Uh, I started working on it in London, I think. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have it finally done and out. And, and, and as bosses, it is, it's, it's kind of a, a, a subterranean march of cats. <laughs> the best I can say was bum, ba dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, 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 Cats down under the stars. Really fine. And Maria Moldo and Donna are singing backgrounds on it, and uh, it's a sweetie. Then there's a song which is uh, my.
by Orpheus. It's called uh, River and Cherise, which is one that I wrote for his several years ago for his uh, second album, Reflections, but it just didn't get around to getting done until now. And it's an uh, Orpheic epic uh, set in New Orleans, rather after the manner of Black Orpheus, uh, in, in that it's, uh, it is taking the Orpheus story and setting it in a, in a uh, carnival atmosphere. I said it in New Orleans, and uh, it has a uh, Reuben, who is Orpheus, who uh, has a painted mandolin and laid with a pretty face in jade. Uh, and it, and uh, after uh, after the betrayal of Eurydice, who is Charisse, uh, with Ruby Claire, the uh, uh, the death scene occurs uh, when uh, Reuben is strumming his uh, painted mandolin to Ruby Claire when she free freezes and turns to stone for the strings played all alone. The voice of Charisse from the face of the mandolin singing, Reuben, Reuben, tell me true, for I have no one but you. Okay, he's saying, it's, you know, it's all cool, but you know, there is no one but you. If you could see in my heart, you'd know it's true. There's none, Charisse, except for you. At the beginning of it, uh, Charisse was dressing as pirouette in white when a fatal vision crossed her side, said, to Charisse, beware tonight. And said, uh, and uh, she, ha she has a vision of, of what's going to go wrong. And, and, uh, and at the end of it, uh, when he brings uh, Eurydice back from the hell, it is uh, uh, Reuben walk. It has one of the repeating themes, and it is her hair hung gently down. And the last scene is uh, Reuben walked the streets of New Orleans till dawn with Charisse so lightly in his arms, and her hair hung gently down. And when Garcia sings this thing, it just brings goosebumps up my arm. He just sh shivers up my spine. The, the, the full, full tragedy is, I, I think, I think we got it. We got Orpheus. Which is, you know, every artist is supposed to do an Orpheus, I feel. And uh, that was ours. When we last left the Grateful Dead, they had left Warner Brothers Records and had gone out to record on their very own record label which unfortunately was a great idea, but short-lived and didn't work out, I guess, on the economic side. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I didn't give them the material. Here, here we were all set up, ready to go, ready to rip. And if I had written albums uh, like I'd been writing, fine, but, you know, it's just one of those situations where you get this nice, snazzy Cadillac and everything, and the battery doesn't work for some reason. It's, uh, my streak ended. I don't know what it was. Is uh, the the feeling Wake of the Flood? I think has some excellent songs on them. I don't there, um, but they don't they don't grab or didn't grab the public the way the other ones did. They're exceedingly laid back for one thing. What is on that album? I think some of the problem was with, with, with the band's choice of tempos on uh, on them. Uh, tunes like. Uh, Row Jimmy Row is a good example of a tune which works very, very well at that tempo uh, on stage because with all the power, they can just get the place, you know, rocking slowly back and forth. But I don't really think it translates to the album at that tempo. A bit quicker would have moved it. Stellar Blue is one of my favorite. I love that. And I'm not certain that it's the best rendition that we've ever done of it on this album. And uh, Mississippi Half Step Uptown Tudor is also, I think, one that suffers uh, for tempo, not to us, you know, or, 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 or to, or to uh, dive in world fan, world fans or anything like that, but uh, the public at large uh, wants things a bit snappier. And uh, uh, Eyes of the World stands on it. That was fairly successful, I think. Sounds about the way it should. Well, um, with the appearance of the Grateful Dead's own record label, Shortly after uh, Wake of the Flood came the release of the first Robert Hunter album. Yeah. Well, I had been working with uh, uh, Roadhog, some of my early bands, and uh, uh, I just I went over to Mickey's and said, "Could I have a couple of days uh, uh, in the studio? I'd like to lay down an album real quick." And about four or five months later, I emerged with this monstrosity, and uh, in which time I. Uh, had to throw away a lot of the early tracks I made with Roadhog because it just they, they just weren't solid and I had uh, 
Uh, Freiburg came in and worked a lot on that album. And Barry Martin helped me out a lot, and Mickey drummed on it. And uh, the album is Tales of the Great Rum Runners. Great cover. Griffin. Yeah, Rick Griffin. Yeah, this and Tiger Rose are two of the best covers that we have amongst all these, I think. But uh, I love the songs on them, on this record. Uh, my singing on it is uh, a little short of pathetic. Well, I hadn't sung in about ten years, like, uh, in front of people. And, uh, I just, um, uh, I hear, it's, it's a lyricist album. It's, uh, it's, uh, no, there's some of them that come off pretty well. I like Run Runners. Scott must have been the roses on it, which remains just about the favorite thing I've written. Mm. I do that with, uh, comfort, too. Yeah, this has got some fine tunes on it. It's a pity that it was it's so rough and ready. Although a lot of people like that quality about it. It's got, certainly, doesn't have any pretension on it because we weren't capable of pretension <laughs> at that point. Moving onward, um, Robert Hunter is with us, and we're talking about his music and the Grateful Dead music and a whole lot of music that he has been involved in. Blues for Allah was released, and boy, Side One sure opened up with a killer. That, that medley of help on the way slipped out in Franklin's Tower was just, I don't know, one of, the, one of the best things I think the Grateful Dead have ever done. My own personal opinion, it seems to be quite popular. I don't, I don't know. This surprise. Oh, I've just heard so many bad reports and so, so few good things ever about this album. Uh, the people didn't take to it. And uh, it was... Uh, I was living at, in England with... Uh, while they were laying down tracks, where this this is the first time I had ever worked this way, where they put down all the the tracks, and so I came in with uh, pretty complete basics to work with, and wrote the uh, wrote the lyrics to an album that was already there, and I'm not certain that, that I uh, do my best work that way. I don't know. Do you have a favorite thing? Any other one? Oh, crazy fingers, I like. Uh, Crazy Fingers is uh, a set of about uh, seven or eight haiku. Each of the verses is a haiku, and I'm rather proud of that. Did the medley that opens up side one, was that all instrumentally combined when you were listening to it, and did you write three separate songs? Is that well, how that happened? Franklin's Tower, I had given Jerry, uh, oh, six months before. That's the only one on this that, uh, that, he, that he set uh music to my words. The rest of them were just uh, given to me. And I worked very, very hard on this album. I, I wrote most of these songs uh, on the other 20, 30 times, uh, trying to get them just right. And I believe that my lyric work, my lyrics are overworked on this. It was uh, just that tendency, you start you start being a professional artist, and you, you take a great deal of pride in what you do, and, and, and you, you sort of start slipping away from your inspiration in a way and you start getting bearing down too hard on it trying to perfect each line trying to make each one a jewel and uh, I'm not for working that way anymore because I don't think it's uh, what it is that I can do with a lyric doesn't really come out um, at its best that way because I, I can make something overlooked I can tool it until it's a glittering jewel that nobody can see but me and if nobody likes it then I don't like it either <laughs> Because they are, they are supposed to communicate. They are supposed to be meaningful. Blues for Allah. And, and following Blues for Allah, wait a second. We've missed Mars Hotel. It's, it's mixed in here probably somewhere else. We probably passed it earlier on. We, we must talk about U.S. Blues. Um, because that is another one. That is a crowd pleaser. That started out as a... Uh, oh... The song that we did, uh, One More Saturday Night, was uh, originally U.S. Blues, but uh, he got it into his mind to rewrite the lyrics, and uh, and then uh, he still wanted to call it U.S. Blues, and I said, no way, I'll write another U.S. Blues, you know, which I did, and that's all I remember of it, uh, I, I don't remember where I wrote it or what. I probably wrote it in England. I was doing a lot of my writing in London at that point. First writing I did in London, the first time I went over there, it was, uh, uh, I had this 
feeling of being an American that I'd never had here in an American writer. And uh, it just put me in a real good perspective about that. And I wrote, uh, I sat down one afternoon, a bottle of Retsina, a case of Retsina. Oh, it was a case. I didn't drink the whole case, but I had all that I wanted. Uh, just bathing and being in England for the first time. You know, a lot of people dream about going to London, and I was one of them, and it was so nice being there. I just sat down, I think, in an hour period. I wrote Ripple Broke Down Palace and to lay me down, and I could have written more. I could, I could have just kept doing it, and uh, uh, I just said, well, that's certainly enough for the day, you know, <laughs> and quit. I kind of wish I'd kept on that day, though. That was one of the best streaks I'd ever had. And when, when you're hot, you're hot. <laughs> a song you have referred to, um, and one that you seem happy about is Scarlet Begonias. Love it. I've just been learning how to perform it uh, with a solo guitar, and it's a lot of fun. It's really a pleasure. Uh, it was originally uh, pages and pages long. There was a very, very involved story there. It was like a uh, quite a plot, and uh, I finally got honed down to just the basic moves, and it, which is best. Although there is a uh, it's originally called Bristol Girls, and there's one line in it that I'm using. I am adding and changing lines or using old verses that, that the dead don't use in some of these songs. Friend of the Devil is another one. And then this is, uh, look all around this whole wide world, never find any, find nothing stranger than a Bristol girl. And uh, so, so I'll get some of that some of that hit back in time. Using in Friend of the Devil, when I perform it, I have a verse that I originally did write when I wrote it with uh, Dave Nelson and... Uh, Dave Nelson and Marmaduke and I sat down. I was playing bass for the New Riders for a while, and we sat down and uh, uh, to write a song, and I came up with that Friend of the Devil. And one of the original verses, which I now use, is uh, the last verse. Uh, you can borrow from the devil. You can borrow from a friend. The devil will give you 20 when your friend got only 10. That gives me a little feeling of, of uh, a more overt ownership of the song. Because you know, these, these have been dead property, these songs, so long that I almost feel but I shouldn't touch them even. But I talked to Jerry about it a couple weeks ago. He said, hell, I said, do any of them you want? He said, you know, like, because uh, uh, we've been playing together at uh, Mutual Gig, or whatever you call it. So I've been opening for him. And uh, uh, it got down to, uh, I said, you know, I don't do It Must Have Been the Roses when uh, when I'm performing with you, although it's, you know, the strongest song in my repertoire, probably. And he said, go ahead and do it. Do any of them. At the same time, and, and we even decided that maybe we would do uh, uh, similar sets some night. I'll do the same. My uh, he do the same material my band did, like that. And uh, there's no reason not to do them twice, three times, because they're all different. I mean, in our interpretations of them. But must have been the roses I had thought of as my signature tune. And old Jer decided he wanted to do it, and I was not too happy about it because I had recorded it already. Because I knew what a monster he is. That uh, that that song would no longer be identified with me once he did it. So I almost think it was a dead tune that I do now. But um, it got out there. And uh, then he wanted to do Tiger Rose. And I said, well, come on, don't do that. You know, I finally said, okay, do must have been the roses. I'm not going to be a dog in a manger about the whole thing. I didn't sell it. Maybe you can. And um, But Tiger Rose is you know, my other signature tune like that. So i got to keep one off. <laughs> so he's agreed. And he won't touch Tiger Rose anyway. All right, our guest is Robert Hunter. I'm Dennis McNamara. We're LIRFM. Boy, we have uh, been tracing through a whole lot of music. Um, to get back to the Grateful Dead, there was the Steal Your Face album, another live collection. What was it uh, that uh, Lester Bangs and Cream Magazine wrote about? Steal your face, ha, huh? steal your money is more like it. <laughs> this is not our most popular album. I don't think I have anything original on it either. Oh, this is the one that must have been the Roses by the Dead. Not a good version. Mm -hmm. they, they have done that so beautifully. Also, Stella Blue, they have done so beautifully. And neither, again, both of these songs uh, don't come up. I, we have not got a definitive Stella Blue recorded. There are so many Grateful Dead tapes around, you would think. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sure. you'd be able to pull them off. Right, yeah, but it's just not the same as doing it when you want it, I guess, for record. To, to move past steal your face you released a second solo album I have the audacity <laughs> and as you mentioned Tiger Rose um, a song that you feel 
an identity, I guess, essentially, to paraphrase you as you sit here. It's the title of my album, you know. So it's a recognition tune. People don't even have to have heard it. They've at least seen the album cover. So when I sing Tiger Rose, they applaud a little bit. <laughs> they know it or not. What was it like going in to do an album the second time around? This album was uh, uh, under the auspices of Round Records. This time, I knew that my album would be released. With Run Runners, uh, I didn't know that. And I was... I don't think I really could have sold that album if I didn't have my own record coming because there's, it doesn't meet professional standards for recording. It's, it's quite dirty in, in some respects. But uh, Tiger Rose is uh, was produced by Garcia. Uh, he got in there. He figured that he was going to... He mixed Run Runners for me. He said it was just oh, a, a real monster. Uh, I made such a mess of my tracks that... Uh, he got in there and did the best he could with them, put it together for me. The Tiger Rose, he decided that he would like to be in there on the laying down of the tracks. I'm afraid that the uh, the tracks sound more uh, like Garcia music than mine, which may, may be good or bad, depending on where you're coming from. It has that, that kind of mellowed out sound that he's into, whereas Run Runners is real, you know, uh, what's the rough and ready, which is more my style, I guess. What about um, some music to pull off? What do you go to? What, what tunes would you would you play first? I would. Uh, hmm. Cruel White Water is probably the best tune on that, from the point of view of, of a good vocal delivery. But not Wild Bill is an excellent tune. I really like that tune. I open my sets with it a lot. Uh, my excuse for the vocals on this thing, I always have to excuse them. Was, uh, my kid was being born over in uh, England, and I had to. Sp I got my vocals down as quick as I could over the tracks and split. And um, I had to. I really wish I'd had more time to uh, get that one together vocally. Next time I do a record, I'm going to get it together, because I've learned how to sing in the meantime. Why is Mickey Hart billed as anti-producer? Oh, Mickey Hart is the most wired cat you've ever met in your life. He has so many ideas, and we had to, like, put him in a bag and tie it up with a rope and put him in the corner, and he's still beating against it with ideas. And, we, you know, like, uh, and we were trying to say, look, you know, even I was you know, at the point, okay, Garcia, you're the producer, you know, like, and I would argue about it and everything like that, and he'd, he'd mutter about it, huh? you know, they always, uh, uh, like that, and they don't understand my true genius. And uh, so finally I sat back and, uh, you know, you, but we you came to the agreement, okay, you can produce this one. You know, I'll, I'll see what you can do with my work. Uh, right? And uh, But Mickey just is in, in, unsuppressible uh, that way. And so it was like we had, and, and usually having good ideas, like a producer, it has to, like one man has to pretty much decide, and he has to decide what other people want and like that. And so it was... It got to the point where I just finally sat over in the corner myself, you know, like that. I, I, I don't have the energy either those cats have in, in, in a certain way in the studio, you know, to fight for a production idea. So I just finally sat back and let him, uh, let Mickey and uh, and uh, Bob Matthews and Garcia slug it out over, over, over what the production was that was going to be. And I could not get a word in edgewise. I just couldn't. I mean, those guys are champion rappers, all three of them. And... Uh, and I'm being a double cancer, I finally have a tendency to go off in the corner and <laughs> introvert. <laughs> I just come out when it's time to do my vocals. <laughs> and tonight we're talking with Robert Hunter in the third part of a three-part conversation with him. We um, get up to 1977 and the Grateful Dead release Terrapin Station. What, um, what was that album like writing for... Um, Certainly, in some respects, a different kind of Grateful Dead. The first one produced outside of the family, essentially. Keith Olsen, who had worked with Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, I'm of two minds about the production on that. Uh, it's uh, n the production is not to my taste. It can now be said now that now that we're not pumping it with everything and trying to sell it anymore. It's uh, died the death of records, which is uh, you know, a couple months moving up there and then they, they disappear. Uh, Terrapin Station itself is a uh, closest thing to a monumental work I've done. It's, it's like a, a, a long song cycle which should uh, take uh, a full album and uh, 
what you have of it lyrically is, is only the uh, introduction and the story and, and the uh, resolution of the symbols is um, all left off. So uh, I don't really know what to say except that Terrapin Station itself, that, that, uh, that piece is uh, dreadfully incomplete to my mind. It doesn't, it doesn't appear to uh, come from anywhere or go anywhere, although in fact it does in a completed, a complete version of it. There wasn't time to work it all out. They were working under a tight schedule. And uh, it just, uh, I think it was a marvelous concept. And uh, in places it comes off quite well. And uh, other places are just, it sounds like somebody else's record, some other band to me in a lot of respects. They would do a bang-up job of that on stage. I would prefer to hear a uh, live recording of it to the uh, to the recorded version. Do you look back very much, or is it really essentially looking forward? Well, this is my foundation. I've got a, I was always conscious of, of, of laying a really a solid foundation as I could, and, and had hopes and fantasies of uh, going off and doing my own number and continuing working with the dead, which I am. Uh, it says in the uh, paper, it has me listed as a uh, former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, which I would like to clear up, as uh, I still am doing it. Mickey came over with a tape the other day. He said Phil and he had been burning the midnight oil. It's time to start writing the next album. And uh, Jerry's got a bunch of uh, lyrics that he's getting together uh, of mine uh, to, uh, I think I'd probably... Uh, It'd be time to get hot on that in another couple of weeks. Get the next album on it. What's it like working for, with, and as a member of the Grateful Dead? Has it really been a long, strange trip? Oh, you better it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's now no longer what does it feel like. Uh, it's like what does it feel like to be a human being or to have a nose. I've been doing it so long I can't, I can't picture myself any other way. It's been... Uh, I've been hanging around with these people, uh, let's see, yeah, geez, I ran into Jerry, I was 19, and he was, he was 18, that's, I'm 36 now, it's half a lifetime ago, that's all I've done in my adult life. <laughs> Quite a musical contribution, and, um, I say, um, I thank you and appreciate the fact that you brought so much fun music to all of us. And um, I wish you the best of luck and, you know, look forward to your work in the future because you've certainly given us something to look forward for. And I want to thank you. Robert Hunter has been our guest. Thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us. And that concludes an expanded edition of Sunday at 9 and a conversation with lyricist Robert Hunter. We certainly hope you've enjoyed it. I'm Dennis McNamara, and Sunday at 9 is a weekly presentation here at the radio produced by Michael Ross. Join us again next Sunday night at 9. WLIR Garden City is the radio station.